And Gilbert, in all her dealings with Willingham, uh, he had never come across to her as somehow sociopathic. And in fact, many people who knew Willingham from his past, including law enforcement officials, his previous parole officer and a judge who had sent him uh, to jail, uh, believed he was actually a messed up, a pretty good kid, and that he would never have um, done something so horrific as kill his own children. And in fact, the only evidence um, that Willingham was a sociopath was presented by two experts at the trial who um, had never actually met Willingham and never interviewed him. One of them was a family counseling uh, psychologist who actually had no background and never published any research or done any scientific studies in sociopathic research. He suggested that Willingham's uh, interest in rock music and his rock posters in the house, including Led Zeppelin and Iron Maiden, suggested that he was into satanic rituals. Willingham's tattoos were also presented as evidence that he was sociopathic and somehow um, uh, abnormal. Uh, at one point, the wife was asked about these on the stand during the penalty phase, and she said, they're just tattoos. And you say, he just has interest in skull, because he had a skull on, on one tattoo. She says, yeah, they're just tattoos. Um, the other uh, psychiatric es expert who, who testified was very famous in Texas at the time. He was known as Dr. Death because he had testified in so many death penalty cases. His name was Gregson. Um, he had testified that a, another um, uh, inmate who was on death row was a sociopath. Um, it was later, that same inmate was later exonerated, exonerated and released from prison. And three years after Gregson testified in the Willingham case, he was expelled um, from the Psychiatric Association nationwide and in Texas for violating its ethics. Now, Elizabeth Gilbert began to have more and more concerns about the case, and so she began to track down witnesses. And one of the witnesses she tracked down in the case uh, was the jailhouse informant, Johnny Webb. Now, when she went to see him, Johnny Webb uh, was extremely paranoid. And uh, as he had testified once, uh, he suffered from mental impairment. He had trouble remembering things. He suffered from multiple psychological disorders. Uh, he said that he was, uh, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, he told her what he had told um, prosecutors uh, and testified to, which is that uh, while he was walking by Willingham's cell, uh, Willingham had spoke to him through a, through a food slot, broke down, and eventually confessed. But uh, Gilbert thought that this seemed very uh, odd because Willingham had always maintained his innocence. And it seemed very odd that he would suddenly confess to someone he didn't share a cell with and didn't even know, as, as, as Webb himself admitted. Um, the confession also took place by a speaker where all the guards could have heard it. It seemed like a very unlikely place for a confession. Not long after Gilbert left, uh, actually Webb sent a letter to the prosecutor recanting his testimony, but he then later recanted his recantation. Now, when I went to visit Webb, uh, he was about as jumpy as a, uh, as a cat on a rocking chair, uh, extremely paranoid, clearly very psychologically unstable. Um, he told me that perhaps he had misunderstood uh, what Willingham said. And then he looked at me and asked me, when does the statute of limitations on perjury expire? <laughs> now, by January 2004, Willingham had exhausted all of his appeals and was scheduled to be executed in February of that year. Now, as the execution date approached, uh, Gilbert and a relative of Willingham contacted Dr. Gerald Hurst, an acclaimed uh, scientist and fire investigator who agreed to review <coughs> all the evidence of arson gathered in Willingham's case which was still the bulk of the case against him and was really the crux of his uh, uh, prosecution. Hurst had received a PhD from chemistry, uh, from the uh, in chemistry from the University of Cambridge. He was an acclaimed scientist who had experimented in the properties of fire for decades, including working on classified weapons projects for the US government. In the early 1990s, uh, he began to be consulted in arson cases as a fire scientist, and he was stunned by the lack of training of many arson investigators it turned out that many arson investigators, especially back then, um, only had high school educations. Uh, they would only take uh, a few hour course, not, not even always, but uh, often they would just take a, you know, a 30 or 40 hour course to be certified as arson investigators. And really what they learned, and, and again, John will talk much more about this, um, bulk of what they learned was, was wisdom passed down from old timers in the field. Um, and yet this wisdom and theories uh, were often um, not scientifically valid or had not been scientifically tested. And when Hearst began to look at the Willingham case, he was stunned by what he found. Um, uh, and again, I'm going to really let John uh, Lentini explain the science. But uh, just to give you a little bit of context, a few of these indicators, the so-called uh, spiderweb intricate pattern on the glass. 
uh, that they found that they said meant the fire burned too hot and too fast and that a liquid accelerant had been used. Well, this has nothing uh, to do uh, with arson. Um, it, it simply has to do with thermal shock from rapid cooling. Uh, when firemen uh, often sent hoses against the glass, uh, that's what causes this to, to happen, not from rapid heating. Um, also, uh, Hearst discovered um, that, uh, that throughout the case, um, the original investigators did not appear to understand basic fire behavior, including one of the most important phenomenons called flashover. Witnesses had seen the Willingham's children room explode with flames, the window shattering and flames shooting out of it. What had happened is the fire had gone to flashover. But, and again, I'll let John explain this, but what it essentially means is that thermal gases have built up in the room, causing everything eventually to ignite. When this happens, scientific studies have shown you get low burning, you get these so-called pore patterns and puddle configurations. They can simply be the product of a natural fire, and they have absolutely nothing to do with arson. By the time Hearst had finished his investigation, he concluded that every one of the 20 indicators of arson were based on old wives' tales and junk science. Fearing that a man who was wrongfully convicted or innocent was about to be executed, he sent his report uh, off to the uh, clemency board and to the governor of Texas. And as you know, the clemency risk system is really supposed to be the feel safe, feel safe in our judicial system to ensure that the worst thing never happens, that an innocent person is executed for a crime he did not commit. Willingham was hopeful Hearst's findings in the past had helped release many prisoners. Um, in fact, several months after uh, he looked at Willingham's case, he looked at another case by a name, Ernest, man named Ernest, Willing, Ernest Willis, who was on death row with Willingham. And the case was eerily similar with puddle, pattern, puddle configuration, poor patterns, all these same indicators. In that case, Hearst again concluded that there was no scientific basis to conclude that the fire was intentionally set. The prosecutor in that case released Willis and he was exonerated as a free man. But in Willingham's case, based on that almost virtually the exact same evidence, the clemency board rejected his appeal for clemency. The government governor turned down his stay. He was sent to the execution chamber, and he was executed. Before he died, he pleaded with his parents uh, to never stop trying to fight to vindicate him. Uh, and several months later, the Chicago Tribune asked several fire investigators, including John Lentini, to review the fire evidence in the case. They concur with Hearst's, re Hearst's results and findings. Nearly two years later, the Innocence Project commissioned an independent panel with John Lentini again and several of the leading fire investigators in this country to review the case. And they once more concluded that there was no scientific basis whatsoever uh, to conclude that the fire was intentionally set. In 2005, Texas established a government commission to investigate allegations of error and misconduct by forensic scientists. The first cases that are being reviewed are the Willingham case and the Willis case. And the fire expert, Craig Byler, was asked by the commission to review all the evidence in the fire case. Um, he concluded that investigators in the Willingham case had no scientific basis for claiming that the fire was arson, ignored evidence that contradicted their theory, had no comprehension of flashover and fire dynamics, relied on discredited folklore, and failed to eliminate potential accidental or alternative causes of the fire. He said that Vasquez, the fire marshal's approach, seemed to deny, quote, rational reasoning and was more characteristic of mystics or psychics. Just before Willingham received the lethal injection, he said, I am an innocent man convicted of a crime I did not commit. <laughs>